Hey everyone, Biofan here with the lovely and talented Mika Simmons, the voice of Queen Honora and several other characters from the Dragon Age series. Hey, hi guys. How, how, how hey. <laughs> how are you? Uh, let's start out with uh, just a few general questions. Like, where are you from? Oh, okay. So I was born in London, um, in, in the UK, in England. I'm English. Um, and then I guess when I was around five years old, my parents moved um, out of London into the English countryside to a an area called Somerset, which is very beautiful. Um, I think they did that because they wanted to give us the upbringing that they never had. They'd both been Londoners themselves and they wanted us to be able to be free. Um, and I was. I, you know, I spent most of my youth barefoot and climbing trees. And, oh, that sounds uh, lovely. Yeah, having a really kind of, um, quite a bohemian, uh, upbringing. Um, I guess the only difficulty with that was that from the age of nine, I knew I wanted to be an actress. So it was kind of a fait accompli that I would end up back in London. So I, I came full circle and I, and I now live in London again. I mean, you, you have to be in London really as an actor to work or, or LA or New York, which is still on my radar, but, um, just waiting for the right job to take me there. So. But yeah, so that was that was my upbringing. What got you into voice acting? So, I when I was training at drama school at Drama Studio London, I got a little bit of an opening into radio drama, and I and I loved it. I loved the fact that when you do just voice acting, you get to be very much just in the character and in your own head it's it's quite anonymous in a way and and when you do stage or or tv or film acting you are um necessarily conscious of what you look like and i and i don't mean that in an egotistical way of whether i look good or not it's just that um you need to make sure particularly for film for example you may be playing something very very emotional but you need to make sure that you keep your facial expressions very small so that um, you don't like a crazy person. Um, and with radio acting, I knew immediately that that wasn't the case, that it was very liberating. Um, but sadly, when I, when I heard myself back, um, I didn't have very much confidence in my voice. So when I was younger, I, I, when I first heard myself at drama school, I was, um, a little uncomfortable. And I think many people have that experience that when they first hear their own voice, mm-hmm. um, it's slightly different today. I mean, I went to drama school 15 years ago. I think today with, um, modern media, with, um, you know, uh, all the social media and the way that we can film so easy on our, on our mobile phones, um, I think that people are much more used to hearing their voices. But back then to record something, was, you know, it was quite an effort. You, we weren't just doing it kind of willy-nilly whenever we felt like it. So it was one of the first times I heard my voice back and I yeah. felt awkward about it. Um, so I had to do quite a lot of work on that. And I, you know, I've, I've, I've done a lot of voice work, um, training. And also I really f- uh, found that, um, different exercises and also treatments. So some osteopathy to release my spine so that my lungs mm-hmm. dropped better and that my diaphragm worked better have really helped me to kind of drop into um, a voice that I feel really comfortable with um, in its normal tone, but also that I can play with a lot and do lots of different things with. So there was a bit of a hiatus where I didn't feel so comfortable with my own voice, but then I left drama school and I got an agent really quickly and got a quite, you know, a really nice job. And um, I was in my agent's office one day and my, there was a voiceover agent um, within that office, uh, Nicola Richardson, who remains my voiceover agent today. So it's a really sweet long-term relationship. Yeah. She, she, I was just in the office seeing my agent about something else and she said, oh, this script's just come in and I need someone to read this. Like, I think it was like a cooking voiceover or something. (laughs) And she was like, oh, Mika, can you do it? And I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Okay. And, um, I read it and she was like, you know, you're really good. And she just took me on into the voiceover department just on the back of a, I mean, it was a stroke of luck, really. Mm -hmm. She just took me on, you know, she just, uh, decided to to put me onto her books um well obviously she saw something in you that was very apparent to us when we see you in the games so that was that was really nice that that's kind of how you got your start yeah yeah so so it was a bit i mean you know i think it is luck but i also think that those situations that occur where 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 synchronicity puts you in a place where you kind of get to audition without even trying um 
they are luck. But, you know, as I said to you before, I've been wanting to be an actress from the age of nine and doing a lot of work towards that. So, you know, you, you hear in interviews, actors say, oh, I just was in the right place at the right time. But actually, we've been putting ourselves in the right place at the right time for many, many years. Yeah. Um, so I feel really lucky, but I also know that I worked really hard to get where I am. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Did you play video games prior to acting in them? I've never really been massively into video games. Um, when I was little, I played Nintendo, but I don't think that really counts. Um, I think everyone played Nintendo when <laughs> they were little. Um, so, and then I did, a, a few years ago, I did a, um, I did the promo. I was the first voice and face of a, a game called um, Plants and Zombies, oh. um, which won a ton of awards. It was... Um, before the type of graphics we've got now, it was one of the kind of first online games. And obviously I was introduced to it by doing the promo for it. And I, mm-hmm. I lost like literally probably half a year playing that game. <laughs> so, and, and I, I think that's, that's the bottom line with me is that I, I think I've got a pretty addictive personality. I'm highly competitive and I hate losing. Yeah. So if I start playing a game, I can lose hours of my life to it. And um, so for me, it's a bit like, okay, I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I have a very busy life and I do a lot of really interesting stuff with it. And it's kind of like, if I start that, I know it's game over for everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it, you get sucked into it and can't stop. And then, oh, yeah, suddenly. Yeah, like, which, is, which is fantastic. So back to more of Dragon Age sort of stuff. Um, yeah. What was it like voicing Anora? Like if you, if you were to, I know this is kind of a biased question since you voice her. If you were to if you were to meet Anora in person, what what would you personally think of her? Oh, for what would I think of Anora? I think probably um, uh, my initial reaction would be blimey, he's <laughs> just a little upstart. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then and then I I think I quite rapidly fall in love with her because I think that she is um, very strong. And she knows who she is and what she wants. And I do believe her heart's in the right place. Um, I think also the fact that so many people seem to hate her makes me love her more. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, She's fiercely independent, which I love. I, you know, I don't think that she relies on a man to help her. Um, I love that about her. Um, and I think that she gets it wrong sometimes, but, but mostly I think that her intentions are, are good coming from the right place yeah do you have any favorite scenes or lines you've recorded and why was it your favorite i have got two favorite lines mm-hmm. of anora um and so not not really scenes because the thing is when you're recording um uh, a, a, a character for a computer game is that the scenes you don't get to play the scenes you just do your lines mm-hmm. so in a in a, in a way uh, you may have a, 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 a sub voice that you play off of, but it's not the same. You don't get the same feeling that you get with a film where you get to do a scene with another actor. Mm-hmm. It was just me in the booth. But I have I have two favorite lines, and one I think is everyone's favorite, which is, we have been given the gift of freedom by our forebearers. Let us not squander it. Um, and I think that's just so important. I think that, you know, in this part of the world, we have been given the gift of freedom and we mustn't squander it. We should spend our lives doing, uh, good things, you know, be true to yourself. Um, always follow the path of happiness. So do what makes you happy and don't squander your freedom because so many other people in the world are uh, lacking that freedom, particularly women. And then the other line that I love is when she takes her father on. Where, <laughs> <clears throat> um, she she says to him, "Enough. I would like to know what you intend to accomplish, father. Should we not be fighting the darkspawn instead of each other?" And I just think in that moment is the moment when she, you know, she speaks up. And I think that that's for me that's the core of Anora. Yeah. You know, should we not be fighting the darkspawn instead of each other? I think that that was a moment when she took her father on um, from her heart. And I think that that um, what she says, should we not be fighting the dark spawn instead of each other? I really believe about life as well that, you know, we spend so much time fighting the wrong battles, you know, that, that for, on the micro level within families through to 
the macro with wars that the, the real fights in life are to fight to keep the planet in life, to look after the environment. Those are the fights or, or, or real evil, not, not the things that we often get wrapped up in, you know. And I think that she uh, recognized that her father, although had started as a good man, had really lost his way and um, was not making choices that, um, that wasn't making the right choices. Yeah. And that takes a lot of courage as a person to stand up to, to your loved ones and say, yeah. that, no, this isn't right, which really just goes to show Honora's strength. Yeah, exactly. What was it like to go from the recording booth to see the character you voiced in action? Well, I guess um, I, I, I saw the character in action when I was doing the recording. So when you're... When you're voicing a character, you do get to see the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, so you do your best to to bring the rhythm of the speech into what the developers have, what the creative developers have, have um, uh, you know, the, the 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 rhythm of the the mouth movement, which can be can be challenging at times. Um, so I so, but I I think really I I guess. You know, I I auditioned for the part of Queen Honora six months before I actually got the job. Mm-hmm. So by the time I came in to first record her, um, I'd sort of forgotten about it. And when I first got the script and then saw her on screen, I think I just thought, yes, I, I know her. I know who she is and I can play her. Um, and it just sort of fitted, mm-hmm. you know, I felt, I felt at home, I think is, yeah. is I felt at home with her and I, I knew who she was. I knew what I needed to do with her. Um, yeah. So, so good, good things, you know, it's, uh, it's a good, ex- it was a good experience. Mm-hmm. What was the voice acting process like at Bioware versus other places? Well, I haven't voiced any other video games yet. Anyone that's listening, I'm, I'm up for it. <laughs> um, uh, I've done, as you know, a few. I did. I've mainly done Anora, and then I've done quite a lot of little other bits. Um, so I don't know about voice acting. Um, I do a lot of voiceover work, so straight voiceover work. I did one yesterday for Laughing Cow Cheese, which was a parody of um, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> Yeah, um, that and, sounds and it, amazing. And it was great fun, and I made them laugh, and it was a great script. Um, I won't say too much more about it because it's not come out, but it will be online soon. Um, and that was really good fun. But mostly, you know, voiceovers are pretty straightforward. You um, and they're quick. You know, you're in and out within an hour. You don't really get to know the people in the booth with you very well. Um, it's a very transient business, the, the voiceover world. And the really nice thing about doing something like Dragon Age is that you get to spend a long time. I mean, you know, I don't remember how long it was like, I think it might have been even something like 20 hours, the first lot, you know, it's like you get to be in the booth with the technician. It's really good fun. I mean, I think when I was, uh, I think I had to do 20 different styles of deaths, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's really good fun. Um, and uh, obviously Caroline Livingston directed um, those first two games that I did. Um, and Caroline is an actress herself, so she's an amazing director. Um, uh, and I felt really safe with her that if my character was, um, if I was losing the character a bit, because sometimes when you're in the booth for that long, you know, you, you know, you can sometimes start to drop back into being yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, she would always nudge me back and... Also, in terms of line readings, uh, if, 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 if the emphasis was on the wrong word, she'd pick it up straight away. Um, so, so it, it was, it, it, it was fantastic. Um, and we just, we had a, a great time. I had one line, which was have at you, which was as in have at you. And, and I couldn't, I couldn't do it without her thinking I was saying have a chew. <laughs> I, I think we, we definitely held up the recording process because, um, because we were laughing so much. Um, yeah, so really, really good fun. And yeah, as I said before, doing, do, being able to do um, deaths 
in a recording booth so no one can see you. So I got to do all these different variations of Queen Honora being stabbed or and maybe it was Isabella actually, but you know, they may not, they, they, they obviously they weren't Honora's deaths. I think that she had some fights, but it's just this feeling of being in a, um, an anonymous space where nobody can see you and you get to do this really kind of big acting, you know, it's like, it's really good fun. It's really, really good fun. Um, I think that doing, I really do think that, 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 that working on Dragon Age is one of the funnest jobs I've ever done. Oh, that's awesome. I know a lot of voice actors when they prepare for characters have to do like kind of quirky things. Like some have to be barefoot or some, some have a special vocal warm up. Do you have any kind of quirky things you do to prepare for voicing characters? Mm, well, no, but when I get in the booth, I always have to undo my jeans <laughs> 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 because skinny, skinny jeans and voice work do, do not mix. It opens should, up your diaphragm. <laughs> I should probably learn to, to start wearing tracky bots to the um to the to the to the jobs, but I don't. Um and then um you know, I do I don't I don't have any quirky things I do, but I definitely don't have dairy before I I work as a voice artist. It clogs my throat up. Um and it's really difficult because the studios themselves, I don't know if you've been to a recording studio, but they are full of chocolate. So I'm basically going, I can't have dairy, I can't have dairy, I can't Oh no, but there's dairy milk there and I want to eat that little cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> oh the oh the cabberries are serious business. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> um and then, you know, uh if I have to record early, then I will always make sure that I am up um with enough time for my voice to clear. Mm-hmm. Um London's a very polluted city and, and first thing in the morning often I'm a bit kind of cloggy from the day before. So, yeah. I don't do anything quirky though. I might say a little prayer. <laughs> <laughs> I do some, I do, you know, say a little, uh, a little prayer to kind of hand my creativity over so that, cause sometimes I have this person that sits on my shoulder that says, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You shouldn't be doing this job. And it's like, hang on, get out of the way. Let's go and have some fun. Yeah. Um, which I think is a, uh, quite a typical trait for artists. This, this, um, I guess it's a slight low self-esteem, you know, that, 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 that it, 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 it's a vulnerable thing to do. So you have to get rid of the inner critic. And I, and I, and I say, I'll say a little prayer just to tell the inner critic to go away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what other Bioware characters other than Anora have you voiced? The other main character that I remember voicing, other than Honora, was Isabella, who I also loved. Um, and I, you know, I was told by the producers that they both, that two producers had wanted me, one for Honora and one for Isabella, and they agreed to let me do both characters. Um, I know that uh, I did voice some other characters as well, but I, if I'm really honest, because they were... Um, not leading characters. I, I don't remember what they were. I'm sorry. Is that bad? <laughs> no, that's okay. If they were, if they're just minor NPCs, it's kind of. I think a lot of voice actors that have worked with Bioware, if it's just a minor character that gets killed after five seconds after meeting them, I don't think they really. It's not a very memorable role. No, but I tell you what is really good fun um, about being able to do different, ask to do different voices. When when you go into the booth and you put your character and then they ask you on the spot to do different ones, is that as an actor, it really stretches you. So Caroline's like, like I've got these two lines, she's French, can you do it? And I'm like, yeah. And, you know, it's just um, you're thrown uh, without any preparation into creating a character on the spot who may and may or may or may not be from your I think I played a wench in one of them. <laughs> that was really good fun. You know, she was like a like sort of low level wenchy kind of working class and she was great fun, you know. And so I mean it's it's a fantastic experience to get to play other characters, but they don't tend to sink into my psyche. I, I don't I think of myself as Queen Honora. I can't help it. <laughs> so you'd definitely say that Honora is your favourite character you voiced? <laughs> She's definitely my favorite character. I love her. I don't care if everyone hates her. I think she's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. What was your favorite part in general about voicing the characters at Bioware? I think some of the experience of being in the booth and getting to play different characters, um, 
you know, as I was saying earlier, that you, you get to challenge yourself as an actor. So, you know, with, with, with the acting process, you get sent a script to prepare for audition, which means you prepared it. And then you get the job. So you then get to prepare that. And with, um, voicing different characters in a video game, they just chuck it at you and go, here, do this. And you go, yeah, I can do that. Um, and you get to listen to it back and it, you know, it sounds good or it doesn't. And you try something else. Um, it's, it's, it's pure creativity being in a recording booth, playing a character. Um, it's really liberating. Um, yeah, I think, I think, I think, I think it's the, the freedom of it is my favorite part about voicing the characters. Has anyone ever recognized you as Anora's voice actor in public? Uh, yes, yes, they have. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I've had, oh, I've had, I've had two crazy situations. Um, I mean, sometimes I'll be at dinner with, with, with friends and their kids will kind of recognize the game and know my character and that that's one thing but I also I was once at an audition for I think it was for a Chekhov play so it was a really serious audition and I it didn't feel like it had gone that well um you know you get a feeling of if you've done a good job or not and often you're wrong I mean often you know you think you've done a really bad job and then you get the job so but I didn't feel like I'd done a really a really good job and then there was a guy there was um a guy who was sat behind a piano I think he'd been there to audition for something else he'd been playing with them I wasn't singing I don't sing um <laughs> and, and I'm about to leave the room and I hear this kind of tiny voice from the corner of the room going by the way I married you and I was like sorry what? And he was like, I married you. And, and I was like, and I, I hadn't played Anora for a while. It was in between games. You know, it had been a good couple of years since we'd been in the studio. And I was like, had no, no comprehension of what he was talking about at all. I was like, how fast you should run away. <laughs> yeah. I was like, did I get married? Am I in, and, and miss it? Did I marry this guy and forget that I married him? <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, no, it was, um, it, it was, it was in the game and it, it was sweet, you know, cause I kind of walked out of the audition. I didn't get the job, but I walked out of the audition kind of feeling like I'd had the, a connection that I hadn't mm-hmm. felt before with the people auditioning me. So that was kind of sweet and funny, um, and weird as well. It was weird. Um, <laughs> and then, and then around the same time, I think it must have been around the same time I was renovating my home. Mm-hmm. And I was in, in a, they have a store in, in London called the Bath Store where you can buy things for your bathroom. And I was looking for toilets and I found a toilet and I went to buy the toilet from the, the chap sat behind the desk and, um, he saw my name and he was like, oh, are you Mika Simmons? And I was like, yes, why? <laughs> what have I done? And, uh, and he was like, he, he said, you're Queen Honora. And I was like, yes, I am Queen Honora. <laughs> and he, um, and he and he and he asked for my for my autograph, um, which was super sweet. And actually, I I, I promised him I'd, I'd take something back to him, which I, I haven't done yet, um, with my autograph on it. Um, he got my signature for the toilet anyway. And, <laughs> That's and then such a then, funny thing to sign a signature for. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then he. And then, and then I was like, I just don't know what's going on with the game. And he was like, well, you've been written out. <laughs> I was going there buying a toilet. And he was like, yeah, yeah, they've written you out. They've done this whole other game and you're not in it. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, we had a bit of a laugh about it. And then obviously I was, I was super relieved when, um, when I got the call to do some more Anora. Um, because <laughs> she wasn't written out at all, as you know, she's yeah, not. She's, she's not. There. She's, <laughs> she is. She's not a leading storyline at the moment, but um, but she's definitely st- she's definitely still in the game. Yeah. 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 And um, <laughs> definitely still there. And um, <clears throat> so now we're going to move into some more fun questions, and then some of them are fan questions as well. Okay. What do you think it would be like if you were stranded on a desert island with Anora? I, I thought about this quite a lot. And I think, I mean, my initial reaction is obviously fantastic because, as you know, I'm a bit in love with her. But, you know, intellectually, if you think about it, Anora has all the qualities that are absolutely essential to staying alive on a desert island. Mm-hmm. I, I think that she would remain calm in the face of, um, aversion or, or in that, in that case, in, in the face of nothingness. Um, I don't think she'd lose her cool. I think she think really quickly about survival, how to get fresh water and food. Um, I think she's really kind of a quick thinker about um, how to 
uh, engage with her environment to get what she wants out of it. Um, I do doubt that Honora would know how to cook um, <laughs> or how to start a fire, which I think are also quite key things. I think once you've found the water, you probably need to be able to start a fire and boil it so you don't kill yourselves. So you I would don't probably was, be in charge of that bit. <laughs> I think, I think, and as you know, I grew up in the countryside, so I'm pretty good at lighting a fire and I definitely know how to cook. I love cooking. So, um, I can take care of those things. Um, the only downside I think is I suspect I would get bossed around a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd have to let Nora be in charge. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, but no, I think, you know, yeah, I think she'd, she'd be a good candidate to be stranded on Desert Island with, providing she didn't kill me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to watch out for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, So this next question, a lot of people are really curious, and I got this a lot from people. Would you personally marry Alistair? Yes. (laughs) And do you know why? Why? Just to get all the fans who hate me so that they couldn't. (laughs) Oh, 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 oh. Oh, man, you're going to definitely get some interesting comments down in the comment section now. (laughs) It's revenge. Revenge. <laughs> what do you think of Kaylin? Mm, hot. I guess that's fair. <laughs> it's not really around you much in the game. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I think we were married at one point. Yeah. You know, um, so I, I think he's hot. Do you know but, what happened there? He's dead, right? I mean, that's what I think of him. He's dead. Do you know what happened between you two before he died? I know we were set up. What? Oh, what happened just before? He cheated on you. Oh, yes, I do know he was a bit naughty. Oh, you, don't, you know that. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that Kaylin had a bit of a wandering eye. Yes, I do know that. Um, <laughs> you know, I still think he's hot. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm susceptible to a bit of a bad boy. So, um, you know, but I wouldn't stay with him. I'd leave him, but, you know. So I, I like them. I like strong men. So, so between Kaylin and Alistair, you're definitely Team Alistair. Mm, uh, no, I'd marry both. Oh, so first oh, oh. of all, I think <laughs> I, I, I'd marry I'd marry Kaylin first, mm-hmm. and and then when he cheats on me, I'd uh, dismiss him, stroke kill him, <laughs> and then marry Alistair. Hey, that's one way to take control of the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> For your portrayal of Honora, do you draw inspiration from any real-life powerful female figures from history or present day, or do you use your own personal interpretation of the script and character to portray her? I always use my own personal uh, personal personality with work. Um, I don't I don't tend to draw on real people for any of the work I do. Um, I try to find the characteristics within myself. Um, I think that if you do it that way, then you create a stronger kind of fulcrum to pivot around or an anchor to work from so that you're working from within rather than a concept or an idea in your head of, of what someone might be like, you know, so you're you rather than them. And I, and I actually, I really believe that we have all qualities inside of us as human beings. Actually, we, we have a little bit of absolutely everything. Um, and you just have to access it. So even if I'm playing a character that feels a very long way away from me, I just try to go inwards and find out situations within myself that I've been in that would reflect that. And then I start to nurture those. Um, yeah. So. Okay. So this next question is, is very controversial and no one's going to exactly, not everyone's going to agree mm. like your answer either way. Do you support the mages or the Templars? Okay, so we need to get honest around this. <laughs> I, I try to live a very honest life. Mm-hmm. I have got absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about them. <laughs> as, as I've been honest with you, I don't really play the game, so I know a lot about Nora and her storyline, and I understand that they are very key to 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 the, the ongoing war. I don't support either of them, <laughs> and, Anora, and neither does Nora. <laughs> Neither of us, neither of us support neither of them. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's a good answer. 
What was your initial reaction when you were first cast in Dragon Age Origins? I was over the moon. I, I'd auditioned probably six months before, and I'd forgotten about it. Um, and at the time that I got the job, I'd been slightly obsessively watching um, Kate Blanchett in Elizabeth, the film Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. And I had huge queen envy at the time. I was like, I want to play that part. Um, and, you know, okay, so 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 playing uh, Queen Anora in Dragon Age is not the same as playing uh, Queen Elizabeth in Elizabeth, but it was like a little gift. I was like, I'd been praying for that, and now it's happening. I'm going to get to play the queen. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, you could say that Anora is my Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. Okay, now this next question, <laughs> you may have a pretty biased answer to, but who do you think is the right choice for the Ferelden throne? Me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think of Nora's father, Logan? Oh, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I think Logan started off as a good man with the right intentions. Um and that he lost his way, as so many people with a great deal of power do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he lost sight of what was the best thing for all and let his ego take over. Yeah. <clears throat> do you know if you'll appear in any future Bioware titles? No. I have I, I have no idea at all. Um, I've not been informed of that yet, and... Um, that is a cue for all Dragon Ages everywhere to bombard Bioware with requests. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> Not including Not- any of the other characters you've voiced, who is your favorite Dragon Age character? So I really like what Alex Wilton Reagan has done with the Inquisitor mm-hmm. in the most recent game. Um, I think she's an incredible voice artist. Uh, I think she's super clever, and I, I really love what she's, she's done with that. And there's another actress called Miranda Raisin, who I'm not sure who she plays in. I think Cassandra. Uh, yeah, I love Miranda's voice. Um, I just think she's got an exquisite tone to her voice, and and her um, intention and her her placement is really beautiful. And there's another actress called Indira Varma, mm-hmm. who is in the most recent game. And again, I don't know the name of her character. I believe it's she's but- Vivian. Yes, she's Vivian. And Indira and I have known each other since we were 11 years old. Oh. And we've never got to work together. And I love, I mean, she's a fantastic actress. She's really, she's, she's, um, super successful in London. You know, she's got a really great career. And I am just over the moon that we've got to work together, even if we were never in the studio together and that we're in the same job. Oh, that's oh. nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you do outside of voice acting? Well, so I I work as an actress full time, uh, mostly theatre and television, um, and I, uh, you know, I play kind of often either the girl next door or really rough rogues. And I and I one of the things I loved about Nora was that she kind of encompassed both of these things. You know, she was kind of like the she was of, of regal stock, so she was um, graceful and well mannered, but she also had a roguish nature in the in the, in the sense that she was so uh, feisty. Um, and I, so, so I write as well. I've um, you know I I've written. I wrote a short film a couple of years ago that we made, and then I last year wrote my first stage play, which I'm uh, I finished, but I'm just doing edits for at the moment. Um, and then I, and then I also, one of the other reasons why I, I don't play video games is because I, I, 18 months ago, I, I started a charity. Mm-hmm. Um, Tell us I lost, about that. yeah, so I, I lost my, my mum to a, a cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, which is one of the gynecological cancers when I was 26. So over 10 years ago. But I, I, um, about a year and a half ago, a doctor came and asked me, who knew that I'd, I'd had this experience of losing my mum, came and asked me to do some fundraising for um, key research into these particular cancers because at the moment they are um, there's not enough awareness or research around them. The gynecological cancers, the group of gynecological cancers, because 
they are not the highest um, number of incidents. There are only around 7,000 women in the UK diagnosed with these cancers each year compared to, say, breast cancer, which is 70,000, I think. Um, you probably shouldn't quote me on, on that figure. But, you know, just to show you the difference between the amount of women who are being diagnosed is is acute. But because the gynecological cancers are so uh, few, or the money tends to go towards the bigger cancers, you know. So I'm raising funds for key research into um, personalized treatment of these cancers. And also we're doing an, a major awareness campaign. So I'm really excited. In September this year, um, we've had a designer called Simeon Farah who has a label called Black Score, which is um, a favorite of kind of, you know, Cara Delevingne and Alexa Chung. And he's designed a sweatshirt for us that's going on sale via Topshop, the, the the brand Topshop, which is a massive UK brand, um, to raise money and also just to get the kind of that, that demographic of young women, the Topshop kind of um, buyers, talking about these things, not to put people into a kind of mode of fear of, oh my gosh, am I going to get it? But more because that area of the body is an area of the body that um, particularly for us in Great Britain, we're shy about talking, you know, we're... we're so, um, so it's a really, it's a very satisfying, um, project to be working on. Um, and we've had an immense amount of support, um, for it since I launched it a year and a half ago. So, um, so that takes up a lot of my time. And that's another reason why I don't play games. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, you know, really lucky in, in a sense that the committee of women that I put together to, um, to run this charity all have had some form of similar experience, whether it be personal or with a very close family member. And we are all um, very determined to change the face of these cancers, to change the way that, and the way that, that women talk about their bodies. Because one of the things that can happen in that area of the body is there's so much change anyway that women will ignore symptoms. And then by the time they go to their doctor, they're already at stage, what we would call stage four, rather than going to their doctor and catching it early uh, when it might be treatable. So, yeah. yeah. For people listening to this interview that would like to get involved and help, is there any, how can they get involved or donate, or is there any website they can go to? Yeah, our website is um, uh, www.gc, so standing for gynecological cancer, gcfund.co.uk. And then the Lady Garden campaign that we're launching with Topshop in September, which is really fun, has its own separate website, which is um, ladygardencampaign.co.uk. And there's loads of ways to donate. We've set up loads of fun things that you can do to be active, to raise funds, or there are really simple ways to donate. You can send a text message to a number and donate £5, or you can um, go to our Just Giving page and donate whatever amount is suitable for you. The fundraising is really important to us um, because we are we've now started this project funding this this particular research fellow to do this work, but we're also um, majorly uh, fighting for more awareness around them. So even just having people like go and look and read about it and talk about it with their friends. Um, you know, we're grateful for that too. It's not all about money. <laughs> Just about exposure as well. For the, yeah. for those listening to the interview, I will put a link up to the websites Mika mentioned, um, either on the screen or in the description. Um, so feel free to check those out as well. And then my last question for you is, do you have any tips for those who are considering pursuing a career in voice acting? <sighs> um... Well, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think I spoke a little bit at the beginning of our interview about um, persistence, you know, that the, the, on the one hand, I feel like I was in the right place at the right time. And I was really lucky that I was in my agent's office when a job came in and, and I read for it for my voiceover agent. And, and you know, she, she liked me and I and I got an admit. I mean, I'm, I'm with a I'm with a, um, a very, very good voice agent. Um, but. I don't know if you know, there's an image, um, a fantastic image of, of, an, of success being like an iceberg. Have you ever seen that image? Mm-mm. So the idea is, is that the success part is the part of the iceberg that people can see. Yeah. But underneath 
that tiny bit of the iceberg that people can see, which they see as success. So people see what you, what they see my, my career, my voiceover career as successful, but what they don't see are all the hidden parts underneath, you know, the, 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 the real bit of the iceberg. And that's the perseverance, the dedication, the overriding rejection, constant repeated rejections, uh, trying to have a life. Um, outside of your acting work, outside of your voice acting work, so trying to be a human being um, and and live, while also staying open for uh, work opportunities that can completely take you in a different direction. Um, and 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 that's the note, really, is that just don't 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 just look at the externals. Really, really see what work we put in to get where we are, and don't give up. Um, well, thank you so much, Mika, for sitting down with me and chatting for this bit. Oh, you're so welcome. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Oh, yeah, no oh. trouble. Um, yeah, let's do it again after the next Dragon Age. Oh, that'd be oh. awesome. Unless Queen Anora really is dead. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll go to the bath store and ask my guy in the bath store. <laughs> Well, I think in, in Origins, if Alistair is king, I think you're just locked in a tower. So, That's so true, I am. <laughs> so you're either, I guess you're doing a most, Rapunzel up there. and then the... most, most common tweet that I see is, I just locked Anora in the tower, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think Anora will play some part in the future, considering she's... I don't think you can ever kill her, so I think she's definitely... she's She has the possibility to return, regardless. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think of Anora as a character? Do you have a favorite Queen Anora moment? Tell me down in the comments! For more Dragon Age and Bioware related videos, be sure to subscribe to my channel by clicking the big blinking subscribe button coming up shortly. For instant Dragon Age and Bioware news coverage, feel free to follow me on my Twitter or new Tumblr links to which can also be found in the description.